we have someone here who has such a colorful career uh, growing up in a small town where you tell me your your phone number was a single digit. Um, My phone number was five, yes. <laughs> five. Uh, I don't think I can reach you that way now. Uh, discovering Wall Street as an avenue for your worldly interests, and then retiring at the age of 37. So I feel like I've missed my, my chance just, just about. Um, only to stay in the invest, investment world ever since. So I, I kind of want to start out by asking, you know, you've kind of told me you stumbled upon Wall Street. This wasn't your interest. You didn't know about stocks and bonds. How did that happen? How did you kind of come into the investing world at a young age? No, I knew absolutely nothing about Wall Street. I knew it was in New York, and I knew something bad happened in 1929. But I, I thought stocks and bonds were the same thing. But I had an interview, with, and I liked the guy, and he liked me. He said, come work for us for the summer. So I did. I, it was Wall Street, and I fell in love. Was that a teenage Teenage years? Or no, no, it was, it was my senior year at university. Mm -hmm. I was going to go to law school and medical school and business school. I was confused. <laughs> but as soon as I found Wall Street, I didn't go to law school, business school, or medical school. I went to Wall Street and had a lot of fun. I've been in that world ever since. So, so you know, a lot of what you've told me uh, and, and what we see from, from your commentary and what you like to get involved in, you're the ultimate alternative investor to me. I mean, we, we have this alternative investment panel next, and we'll be defining it a little bit differently, I think, with a lot of the assets we get into these days. But you've often run against the tide. I mean, does tell me why. <laughs> does that ever scare you to kind of take those alternative positions? Uh, well, Michelle, I never thought of it that way. I mean, I know people say that. I just try to find things that are cheap, whatever <laughs> they are and wherever they are. I've been investing in Uzbekistan recently because it's cheap. And it's not as though I was saying, let's find something new and different. I found, I think I found something cheap, so I invest there. But there has to be a reason. What do you, what do you like about Uzbekistan? What I like about, well, Uzbekistan was an old Soviet uh, republic that was a disaster, and it was run by a guy who ruined it. But now there's a new crowd, and they're changing, and they're running it the way you would run it, or Bloomberg <laughs> would run it, or I would run it. I think, I hope, and so I've started investing there. It's so very the cheap. There. So where else are you looking now that you think, you know, we've kind of played well, the gloom and doom? And Michelle, as I look around the world, bonds are a bubble. Bonds have never been this expensive in history. Property in many places, New Zealand, Korea, many places, property is a bubble because of low interest rates. Well, interest rates are going to go higher. So property is not a great place. Many stocks were a bubble. Samsung went up every day. Tencent went up, you know. Many stocks were forming a bubble. It's calmed down now. But the only asset that I know that's still cheap is, I mean, commodities. Silver is down 75% from its all-time high, <laughs> you know. These things are very, very cheap, and those are not bubble numbers. So, uh, And if we're going to have inflation, which we are, if you own the things that go up in price, when there's inflation, you make money. And mm. by definition, Commodities go up when there's inflation. I do want to get into that inflationary environment in a bit, but uh, you know, you've told me, speaking of alternative investments, that you don't trade in crypto. And it, it makes sense to me in some respects because I understand that you say you most identify with the Austri Austrian school of thought in economics. So perhaps there's a little element of uh, you know, understanding, as you say, that regulation could be coming down the line. It might be uh, you know, choking off a, a sort of free market there. Can you tell, tell us a little bit about why you're not invested in crypto, uh, what the, what the well, outlook well, is for that? Michelle, as I look around, a lot of people I know are investing in crypto and having fun and making money. <laughs> Many have already disappeared and gone to zero. My wife invests in crypto, of all things. But <laughs> I don't invest in them because the, the bulls say they're going to be money. And my answer to that is, if and when all our money is on our computer, it's going to be government money. Mm. It's not, when the US government says, okay, this is money now, and every government is working on crypto money, they're not gonna say, this is money, but if you want to use that money, you can use that money. That's not the way bureaucrats think. That's not the way politicians think. They want control. They want to regulate everything. And so, in my view, if they're just trading vehicles, fine. Mm. Have at it. 
and I'm not a good trader. So the, so the recent crypto it. crashes don't change your mind about you know any consumer behavior that might be destabilizing, or that's not your your well, philosophy. Well, things change, then I have to change too. But no, I don't see anything that's going to make me. If suddenly the euro is all <laughs> denominated in crypto, then I'll have to change. But no, I don't see that. Well, let's talk about the broader macro landscape right now. I mean, you're a very worldly person. You've traveled all over the world, uh, and have great interests in, internationally. So the IMF says we're on the brink of global recession. <laughs> We've got a raging debate about U.S. recession prospects. We've got inflation still high. We've got developing economies, especially seeing crashing currencies. I mean, where, with all this gloom and doom, uh, I mean, do you kind of share this sort of pessimistic outlook right now, or where, where are you seeing... Uh... Well, Michelle, it's been over 13 years since in the U.S. there was a problem. That's the longest in American history, and I use America since it's the largest. So we're going to have recessions again, and we're overdue. I don't know when. You should watch Bloomberg. They will <laughs> tell you when. Um, it's good advertisement. Yeah. There's a lot of pessimism around right now. And I, usually when there's a lot of pessimism, something happens to cause the pessimism to, to rise. So I would suspect some, maybe peace in Ukraine. I don't know. I'm just guessing. Something will happen. Everybody will get optimistic again. Uh, we'll have one last blow off. We often have blow offs in markets after a long, long rise and we have a blow off. I would suspect we'll have a blow off. And that's the time to sell and to sell short. That's, I hope I'm smart enough to short that blow off. <laughs> well, you said for a while that the next crash will be a big one. I mean, can you, well, even Michelle, if you're not projecting when it might come, what, why? Why is it going to be so In 2008, we had a big problem because of too much debt. Yeah. Look out the window. The debt since 2008 has <laughs> skyrocketed everywhere. Look at Japan. Look at America. Look at everywhere. The debt has gone up by staggering amounts since 2008. So... I don't see how the next one cannot be the worst in my lifetime. It just seems to me a simple conclusion. Is there any prescription that you have, not just for investors, but what do you want to see governments, policymakers looking at right now? <laughs> Resign. <laughs> <laughs> Most government policymakers have no clue, certainly not in Washington, D.C. So, no, I mean, I would tell them, yes, yeah, stop spending money and reduce the debt. Ah, you think <laughs> they're going to do that? No, how about no. the, the policymakers in Uzbekistan? They care. I mean, the policymakers in Uzbekistan know what to do. They have to open their economy, attract capital, and develop capitalism. That's what they're trying to do, I hope. That's why I've invested in Uzbekistan. But Uzbekistan has been a nightmare for hundreds of years. Yeah. This is not, this is not, this is probably their first bull market mm. in many decades. Mm. So, I mean, speaking of, you know, government officials and, and policymakers, the challenges these days, I mean, do you, how do you judge how central bankers have handled this crisis compared to previous crises? I mean, we talk a lot about credibility and, uh, you know, they may have missed the boat on inflation and in a lot of different economies. I mean, what, where do you think the state of play is? I understand you're not a huge fan. No, <laughs> have they, have I, they gotten I, worse? Is there a danger that, uh, you know, investors and policymakers are completely talking past each other? Don't you think so? <laughs> Don't you read Bloomberg? Well, you're, you're the one with the answers here. Well, uh, in America, we've had three central banks. The first two central banks disappeared because of mistakes. This one's going to disappear, too, eventually. Uh, we've only had three in the U.S., three good, two good central bankers in my lifetime. India had a very good central banker a few years ago. But as I look around in my history, I don't remember very many good central bankers. Most of these guys are bureaucrats and academics. They don't know what they're doing. They know what they read. They know how to keep their job, but they don't care about you and me. Mm. They care about their job. And most of these, Paul, we had one named Paul Volcker who ended the inflation of the 70s, but it's because he knew what to do. And the president said to him, you can do anything you want. To give Jimmy Carter, his name was Jimmy Carter, the president, he said, you can do anything you want. And Volcker said, are you sure? And Carter said, yes. Well, Carter lost the presidency <laughs> because Volcker took interest rates. And you, you won't believe this, but at the end of 1979, treasury bills in the U.S. yielded over 20%. <laughs> That's not a typo, over 20%. 
long-term government bonds yielded over 15% because Volcker knew what he had to do and he did it. And that we may have that problem again. Mm -hmm. So I, I trust that you're not too confident that the, the Fed this time will be able to manage the soft landing that they're seeking. You're right. You're right. <laughs> I don't have to worry Bloomberg to know that. <laughs> well, let's, let's move on to a, a particular hot spot that I know that you, you have a lot to talk about, uh, and that is China. Um, so you told me about how your daughters speak Mandarin. Obviously, China is very close to your heart. Um, a lot is going on there these days. I, if we just look at the short term right now, though, I mean, you've got regulatory curbs, Taiwan tensions, property market challenges. You know, what, what do you see that makes you hopeful in the outlook for China? Well, China theory? certainly has had a bubble, a property bubble, which Beijing has talked about ending for several years. They never did anything, but now it's happening. The property bubble is popping. Uh, you're going to have more bankruptcies in China. Uh, and Beijing says they'll let people go bankrupt. I hope they mean it. It'll be good for China. It'll be good for the world. Uh, and then we can start over. But Michelle, America became the most successful country in the 20th century. But mm -hmm. along the way, we had civil war, bankruptcies, riots in the street, massacres in the streets. We had many problems, but we became very successful. China will have problems, but... I, anyway, live in Asia because of China, and I want my children to know Asia and to speak Mandarin because I don't see anybody else in the 21st century. And how about, I have to ask, on U.S.-China tensions, I mean, we've got, you know, Taiwan this week is capturing the interest of people all over the world. Um, well, you know, how I are you mean, feeling about this situation and, and the outlook for well, ending it, it somewhat looks, smoothly. It looks like the people in Washington want a war. I don't want a war, but um, it is very perplexing what America is doing with Taiwan. I don't know why it's so important to us, why we want to go to war and get everybody killed because of Taiwan, but it looks to me like we do. It is insane, but let's hope I'm wrong. Let's mm. hope I'm wrong. Well, elsewhere in the region, I mean, talking about some of your calls for bright spots in the world, you've had an out of consensus view on North Korea, I understand. So talk to us about that. Why, why do you see such prospects there? And obviously you can't put your money there right now, but I do you see it happening in, in your lifetime? I wish I could invest in North Korea, but I cannot. But no, once, once the DMZ opens, once the 38th parallel opens, it's going to be a very exciting place. They have cheap labor, educated labor, natural resources, capital, management ability. It's 80 million people right on the Chinese border. It's going to be very, very exciting if they open up. And the kid wants to open up. So far, the American army won't let him. The problem is the American army will not leave. It's the only place that America can keep troops on the Chinese border and the Russian border, so they won't leave. That's the problem. The kid wants peace. The kid wants to do what, for Korea, what the, the Chinese did in China. But unfortunately, the American army won't leave. But if and when, it's going to be very, very exciting. Do you, do you see that happening in the next? I see it day? happening, but I may be the only one who yeah. sees it happening. Yeah. So far, the American army, Mr. Trump thought he could win the Nobel Prize. The American army said, no, we're not going to leave, Mr. Trump. Well, I do want to take at least one question from the audience here. There's one uh, who says, Jim, I remember your talk on stage using a sachet of sugar as an example. You were proven right about food getting more expensive. I wonder when this was. What is your current outlook on the subject of food inflation? Well, agriculture has been a disaster for 30 years or so. Uh, the average age of farmers in America is 58. The average age in Japan is 66. I mean, farming has been a disaster for a long time. The, the Chinese have a wonderful word, weiji. It means disaster and opportunity, the same thing. So I see great opportunities in agriculture. Um, I've invested in agriculture and I plan to invest more because it, either we're not gonna have clothes, <laughs> or we're not gonna have food, or, or agriculture is going to continue to get better. What about this current current run of food price growth, especially? I mean, do you see, obviously it's very hard to predict with all the weather impact as well, but where are we on, on the food inflation story? Well, inventories are being worked down because of the war and because of the, the virus. Uh, I, would, I am investing in agriculture and plan to invest more because 
I see something has to change, and it's starting to change. Mm. And the war, of course, in Ukraine makes agriculture even more, it makes it more attractive because there is no food. Mm. Because you, the, China, the Russians and the Ukrainians are both huge producers of food. If you're having a war, you don't plant many crops. Mm. And so things are going, I think things are going to get better. I recall that you've, you've told young investors to get involved in goods, commodities. Uh, well, if you like working outdoors, agriculture, is going to, as I said, <laughs> the average age of farmers in Japan is 66. <laughs> America is 58. The highest rate of suicide in the UK has been in agriculture. Nobody wants to be a farmer. That means there's opportunity because there's not much competition. Well, let me take uh, one other audience question. Uh, you know, what, what is your view on India? Well, if you can only visit one country in your life, I would urge you to visit India. There's no place, no place like it. The food, the sights, the men, the women, everybody. It's a very, very exciting place. But it's not a, it's the world's worst bureaucracy. They learned bureaucracy from the English, then they took it to a higher plane. The horrible bureaucracy. Uh, if you can find a smart Indian, and there are plenty of smart Indians, you'll get very, very rich. But you have to be aware of the bureaucracy because it's, it's a nightmare. Well, and at times, I have invested in India, but not now. I wish we could take a, a sort of global tour because one of the most fun facts about you is that you have a Guinness Book of World Record for what, motorcycling across six continents, huh? I have, so you've seen... I have two Guinness records for going around the world, but <laughs> Michelle, it doesn't pay the rent. Well, this, this is what I wanted to ask you. I mean, to end on a high note, you know, you've, you've recently written a book dedicated to your daughters about, you know, how to achieve success. And, uh, you know, a lot of advice for young people especially, right? So give us a little bit of a flavor. How does one become someone who's comfortable Flitting across the world on the motorcycle, but also you know engaging every day with a very fast-paced investment world. Well, I've tried to teach my daughters that the money is to be saved; it's not to be spent. I got them piggy banks when they were very young, so that six piggy banks, so they could put <laughs> money, different currencies, into mm. the piggy bank. I wanted them to grow up thinking. What money, were those currencies, by the way? Singapore dollars, U.S. dollars, British pounds, Chinese. It depends on where we are. <laughs> uh, we travel some. So I want them to think of money as something to be saved, not to be spent. We all know many people who have ruined their lives because they didn't understand money. When my 14-year-old, when she got a, when she turned 14, I told her she had to get a job because everybody should learn about work. I thought she would go to McDonald's and make $8 an hour. She's smarter than I am. She got a job teaching Mandarin at $30 an hour. And she complained because the grown-ups make $60 an hour. I said, you're 14. Anyway, I've tried to teach them about working, about saving, about, you know, that money is not just to be frittered away. Do you worry at all about this next generation of investors? I mean, we're... Of course I, I worry about this generation of investors. What, what, is your, what is your biggest worry about the current... The, the staggering amount of debt, which m most people these days think is normal and not something to worry about. I've read enough history to know that it is something to worry about, and it's going to cause us many, many problems down the road. Even after the next crash? Well, after the next crash, yeah, the next crash is going to be horrible, uh, and it may wipe out a lot of debt. So, yeah, if we start over, yes, or if we eliminate a lot of the debt, things will be better. But right now... That's what I worry about a great deal. All right. Well, let's finish on a high note. Maybe, maybe one area of the world it could be an asset class, could be a geography, could be something that's underestimated in its investment potential right now. Can you just give us? Well, I mentioned Uzbekistan, yep. agriculture. I mean, agriculture, agriculture is still a disaster. So I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I would say agriculture is probably very attractive right now. Mm -hmm. Well, or you. another no, people should learn to sell short. Most people do not. But you sell don't short. want to do that, right? I sometimes sell short, but it's just it, it is a forgotten art, and people need to learn about selling short again it takes a lot for of the next few years.